Redemption Church. Good to see you. Happy Sunday. I'll tell you what, God is good. Mm -mm -mm. Some of you may have seen this heartbreaking story out on social media. One of you even posted it. And uh, I want to share it. I actually have the transcript here in front of me. And uh, it's the story of a panicked husband who couldn't locate his wife for quite some time. And naturally, he was a little distraught, and he was panicked. He did the right thing, and he called the sheriff. And he said to the sheriff, according to the scramp trip, uh, you, you have to help me. My wife, Jill, is missing, and she has been for some time. She went shopping yesterday, and she still has not come home. To which the sheriff replied, sir, just relax. This happens from time to time. Just tell me about her. We'll get a description put together, and we will get it out there. Okay, let's begin by the simple things. Can you tell me what was her height? Uh, I think she's like a little over five feet tall, it says. I'm not really sure. I, I don't measure her very often. Um, okay, can you tell me her weight? Um, well, she's, she's <laughs> careful. <laughs> she's not like super skinny, but she's, I mean, she's not fat, but she's, I don't know, like somewhere in between. Does that help? Okay, let's move on. Can you tell me the color of her eyes? Yes, they are brownish with a little gre green, is it green? There might be some blue. I am so, I am a terrible husband. I don't think I've ever noticed. Okay, can you tell me the color of her hair, sir? Yes, I can. It's blonde. No, it changed. It's brownish. It's, there's a little red in it. And, oh, you know, to be honest, I'm having a hard time describing it. It's, it's, it's hair. It's, it's there. And I'm just, I'm so sorry. This is not going well. And he said, Sir, what was she wearing? Can you tell me that? Yes, I can. She was wearing pants. <laughs> Maybe it, it could have been shorts. Maybe a skirt. I don't know. Oh, this is awful. I'm feeling worse about this phone call. Okay, no problem. At least describe what did she leave in? Did she, was she walking? Or she, no, she was in my truck. Can you describe what kind of truck it was? It was a 2016 Pearl White Ram Limited 4x4 with 6.4 Hemi V8 engine, LED lighting, sunroof, DVD, full GPS navigation, satellite radio, heated leather seats, dual climate control, three USB ports, four power outlets, WeatherTech floor mats, and six cup holders. At this point, the husband just started to choke up and he lost it. And the sheriff tried to console him and said, sir, take it easy. We'll, we'll find your truck. <laughs> And he said, he was a good husband. He says, I don't, I don't care about the truck. That's not what's important. It's just, I, I remembered my fishing poles were in there. I just, <laughs> you know, this is why we're looking at relationships today. Because that is the classic example of how a husband and a wife relate. But let me say, this morning is not just for those who are married. It's not for those who want, it, it really, it's for everybody. If you've ever been in a relationship, you need this. If you want to ever be in a relationship, you need this. If you know anyone who's in a relationship, you need this because we need to be able to give godly counsel because we are not hearing these things anymore. Everything is being turned upside down and things are being thrown out and things are being redefined and we want to go and find out what is God's wisdom? What does his word say about this? It is no secret that the state of the family today is not that great. I mean, it is, it is sobering here. As you look at the statistics, in the population at large, it says fewer and fewer people are choosing to get married. Yet cohabitation numbers are up. But childbirths are down except for children born out of wedlock. And the sobering part about this for all of us, even among professing believers, the state of marriage and the health of the family is now largely paralleling that of society as a whole. That should set off warning bells for us. That should be troubling to all of us. Perhaps the main reason is because the family was created by God. And we make no apologies for that. The family was God's idea to be the cornerstone for society, to be the refuge, that source of hope and stability where you could come running into when the world was falling around. You know, your children need that safe place. Think of it this way. Look at the Bible and what God says and what we're going to read in just a minute. The very first thing after Adam was made, God created woman. And the very first thing he did was bring the woman to the man and unite them together. 
That was the first thing he did. That should tell you right there that the importance of the family was established in the beginning. Now think about Adam and Eve. They were the only ones to start with an absolutely perfect marriage, right? They didn't have any in-laws to deal with. See what I'm saying? <laughs> think about this. They didn't have to have those fights. Where are we going for Christmas? We're going to mine for Thanksgiving. We didn't, we didn't have to do that. They had the perfect marriage because Eve couldn't complain about the man she would have married, and Adam couldn't go complaining that his mom was a better cook. They couldn't do this. This is one of those things. By the way, that was in Dr. Rumley's original marriage ceremony, and that stands out to me. It's one of those beautiful things. When we look at the stability and the security that we are all looking for, God had established it originally for the family to be found in. It was the original institution. He established it, and godly relationships. Now, hear me. No family is perfect. No relationship is perfect. No marriage is perfect. We are all, every one of us, broken vessels. Amen? Amen? Thankfully, we serve a God who specializes in restoring broken things. Now, I want to I give you a disclaimer here, okay? Because we all come from various backgrounds. If you have been part of a bad relationship, or if you have come out of a tough marital situation, or you're in a rough family dynamic, and that's in your past, and you have moved forward with the Lord, and you've sought healing, and you've sought forgiveness when necessary, today is not about that at all. So you can relax, you can breathe easy. We are all in this together. Today is wisdom for everyone, okay? So everybody just sit back and relax. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 2, right at the beginning of your Bible. While you do that, let me welcome those who are streaming. If you're listening to us online, it is great to have you with us as well. God bless you. Genesis chapter 2, and uh, let me give you the historical context of what's happened. Genesis chapter 1, God has created everything, okay? Now you're up to speed. So here we are. He's created everything, and he calls it good. Boom, I created that. It's good. He creates that. It's good. I created that. It is good. And then he brings Adam, and he sets him in the middle of the Garden of Eden, and he says, I want you to tend it, and I want you to keep it. Okay? This is your domain. And that brings us up to where we start today. Verse 18. Read with me, and it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and he closed up the flesh in its place. Verse 22, then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he fashioned into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall be in conflict perpetually. <laughs> oh, does yours not say that? What does it say? They shall be one flesh. What a beautiful, beautiful illustration. I want to point out something here, okay? If you're not into the original Hebrew and looking at this, let me point out the original Hebrew word for helper used here carries with it the connotation that Eve corresponds precisely to Adam. And it is not an accident. They were designed intentionally by God to fulfill his purpose and his plan. Not my plan, not your plan, but his plan. Dr. David Jeremiah, he puts it like this. He says, Eve was designed specifically to supply strengths that Adam lacked. The Hebrew term used here does not imply in any way that the helper is weaker or less valuable than the one they are supposed to help. In fact, ladies, you'll be happy to hear this. The Hebrew word for help actually is a word meaning power. So you heard it first. Girl power, right here. Right here in script. You go, girl. Right here, you see this in Genesis chapter 2. That word literally means power. One of the reasons that God created Eve was because he looked around and he saw Adam's aloneness and he said, not good. Not good. Think about that. This is a huge contrast to everything he's created, the stars, the firmament, the world, all these things. And he's like, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. Not good. <laughs> I heard the joke that yeah, that's why God had to create Eve because he had to try again. Adam just wasn't good. That's not the case. It was not good in his aloneness. Man wasn't meant to be that way. So he brings these two together. Now, it's kind of sad in this day and age that we live that we even have to go over basics of God's design and, and basics of his plan. But we do. So let me ask the very first question for us today. What is God's ideal plan for his children? According to his word, marriage is ideally a relationship with each spouse bringing to it 
true and holy and complete companionship to the other, okay? Dr. Jeremiah continues like this. He says, God's design for relationships for marriage and the family is to begin with a blessed and holy lifelong union between one man and one woman. His plan. Now think about this. Notice nowhere in scripture does it say, this is the plan for 6,000 years. This will be my holy plan for bedrock of society until you think of a better way. Until you advise me, even though I am the God of all things, until you take a vote and redefine this. Come on. Nowhere does it say, this is my plan and I know best and I create everything, but one day you will be wiser than me. And at that point, dear children, would you please give me your advice and your consent as to what I really should do? We are not the editors of the book. We are the guardians. We are the, the delivery people, the messengers of his book. So he goes on and he says, the ideal goal is for this. This is the ideal. Do we fall short of this? Absolutely. But it is supposed to be the permanent union between a husband and wife that will serve as the building block for a stable society. And it's meant to provide that spiritual, emotional, and physical unity that will sustain the human race through procreation of children in a safe environment. Now think about this. Most people stop there and go, I kind of get that. I vaguely remember hearing that for about the last 5,000 years. However, they miss a spiritual component. Most people totally overlook this because they look at it with a secular, humanistic, or atheistic viewpoint. But God designed this, and he goes on to say marriage is supposed to foreshadow God's relationship with Israel. People totally miss that. And furthermore, it will also symbolize Christ's relationship with the church. What does he call the church? The bride of Christ. Notice how God himself took on familial titles for himself. Family titles, calling himself things like father. Calling his own son, son. And calling the bride of Christ what he would come back for, the church. Definitions matter to him, and they haven't changed. God's ideal plan and relationships are so important to him. He put it in the very beginning, but something happened. If you read on, right in the very next chapter, you see that the tempter showed up. Satan, that old snake, the serpent himself, makes his debut, he shows up, and everything changes. Now, before I proceed, I need to ask a question. How many people here like snakes. Okay, everybody look, these are the weird people, okay? <laughs> just letting you know, I'm just kidding, it's okay. Let me ask the other side of the spectrum. How many here do not like snakes? Okay, normal people, I get it, that is great, and I understand, let me say something. For the next 30 seconds, you might wanna tune out. Pastors don't say that very often, but I give you permission. You have my blessing for 30 seconds. You can even pull up Facebook and check in, maybe go like the Potter's Hand page. You don't want to hear what I'm about to say. For the unnormal people, though, listen to what happens here. There was a young lady named Kelly Swisher. She was minding her own business, just driving down Interstate 49 in Arkansas, I believe, doing 70 miles an hour, having a great time, when out of the blue, a giant rat snake drops from her dashboard on, <laughs> I haven't even told you yet, onto her lap, slithers down her legs, goes under her feet, and disappears under the seat. Y'all, confession time. I don't like spiders. I don't hate them, but I really don't like them. I'm that guy that when I walk through a spider web, even if I just think I have walked through a spider web. I start doing the spaz dance. What, you saw me. It's like, get it up, get it up, get, get it up. Is it, is it in my hair? Well, it's not my hair, but is it anywhere? Is it, is it around? Get, 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 and you start doing that dance. I can't even imagine the dance I would do if a rat snake <laughs> fell in my lap while I'm doing 70 miles an hour on the interstate. This has a happy ending, by the way. Kelly Swisher somehow, miraculously, maintains control of the car, slows down, pulls over on the shoulder of the interstate, gets out, calls the authorities, they come, they remove the snake, and she goes on her way as if nothing happened. She deserves a medal. <laughs> this is the spiritual outlet I, I want to put to this. This very thing can happen to us anytime 
in a spiritual sense. That serpent, the old devil himself, can show up anytime, lurking around and dropping out of nowhere into our laps, and he does his best to try to sidetrack us, to destroy our relationships, to rob us of purity and peace. The family, your marriage, your children, I promise they are under assault. Eyes wide open, church. Keep your guard up. So how did Jesus deal with this? How did he deal with the enemy? Let's go back to the scriptures. It's important to note that on two occasions, very specifically, once at the very beginning of his earthly ministry, and then one at the very end, Jesus is saying this. Look at the first one first. This is in Matthew chapter 6. He's praying. You might recognize this prayer. Deliver us from the evil one. He's talking about the tempter. Deliver us from temptation. Deliver us from that evil one. That's at the very beginning of his earthly ministry. Then fast forward to the last night of his life, and he's having this beautiful prayer with the Father, and he says, Father, I don't pray that you would take them out of the world. I pray that you would keep them from who? The evil one. These are the words of Jesus. So we would be very wise, and that's what we want, to be wise, to heed his words. Look at these prayers. Ask God to protect you, to deliver you and yours from the old serpent. Start there. That is your first antidote. Our safety is found in Christ alone in a strong daily prayer life. It's crucial for driving down the road and avoiding those wrecks when the rat snake falls into your lap, because it will happen. There's a fantastic book out called The Solomon Seduction by Mark Atterbury. And the subtitle is, What You Can Learn from the Wisest Fool in the Bible. What a beautiful topic. Y'all know King Solomon. If you don't, he's famous for many things. Immeasurable wealth. The richest man ever. Undescribable wisdom. The wisest man ever. He had fame. He had it all. But let's not kid ourselves. When you study Solomon, the thing that blows you away is his crazy number of ladies. His relationships. You want the numbers? 700 wives plus 300 concubines. Not porcupines, concubines. <laughs> Not great at math, but I think that's a thousand ladies. What? I heard the joke. A guy said, who would want a thousand wives? I can't please one. Why would this guy think this is, he's supposed to be the wise one, but statistics say, while we may not have a thousand mistresses, statistics say we are dangerously close to many of us having one, to straying dangerously close to forbidden territory. And too long the church has been reactive to this, to problems and situations in our culture. And rather than us have to do a ton of counseling after the damage is done, here's a thought. How about we be proactive and we teach the next generation God's design from the get-go, and we avoid all the pain and the sin of bad consequences. How about that? So today we're diving in, man. We're going to be proactive. I want to share with you five illusions that I notice that the enemy is using amongst us. This is just five. Five things that ruin our relationships and ruin our testimony. Let me ask you this. If you're driving down the road, and you look in your mirror, and you see these in your rearview mirror, what do you think? What's the first thing you do? You look down at your speedometer, right? Sinners, come on now. You see these in your rearview mirror, and you immediately let off the gas, right? And you start feeling, am I wearing my seatbelt? Put the phone down, put the phone down. I was texting the pastor. It's okay. Honestly, officer, I said, look, you can look. My pastor's name is Michelle. I don't know what, you know. This is a warning for us. When you see these alarms going off, this is how you should react when these illusions start to crop up in your life because they are a lie from the enemy. This is what we need to do. Okay, so we're going to look at the illusions first and the scriptural antidotes next. Illusion number one, if you got your pens, get them ready. They're about to catch fire. Illusion one, that which seems harmless is actually dangerous. That which you think is harmless and innocent is not it is full of danger. Well, what is it that seems harmless, Pastor? It starts with something as simple as flirting. What? Are we really going there? Yeah, we're going there. So many married people do this all the time, and it can be something as innocent as body language, 
or a, or a seemingly innocent touch or, or, a, or a word, or maybe not so innocent. Maybe it's something overt, and these people, and they flirt, and they're going around, and they're waiting to see what your reaction is going to be. And if you challenge a flirtatious person, likely they will quickly become defensive and try to laugh you out of the room as if you have lost your mind. Why is that? Because nearly every illicit affair in history has started in the harmless stage. Just a little flirtatious here and there. I can't think of anything, anything that has more potential danger explosively wrapped up in it than someone who's flirting with someone who is off limits. This has no place, especially in the life of a believer. Knock it off. It is not harmless, and it opens the door to the enemy. Remember, that old serpent driving down the road, he will drop in your lap at any time. You need to have your guard up. That's illusion number one. Illusion number two, that which seems perfect is actually deeply flawed. That which seems perfect is actually deeply flawed. Well, what is it that seems perfect, Pastor? Well, that other person, of course. That other person that you look at, oh, they're so perfect. Guys, your wife used to laugh at your jokes, and now she just rolls her eyes at you. Oh, but that other lady, oh, you're the funniest guy ever. She practically falls down laughing at your lame jokes. <laughs> right? You know what I'm talking about. Your wife, if you're looking across the table at her at night, she's been obsessing all day over the kids and bills and work and laundry, but that other woman... She doesn't obsess about anything except you. She only has eyes for you. She's only interested in you. Your wife has worked all day and comes home tired, and she puts on sweatpants. Oh, but that other woman, oh, she is always dressed like a fashion model. And when she walks by, she... She smells like a a field of lilacs. (laughs) That is an illusion. Hear me, guys. Ladies, this, this works in reverse. That is a lie. If that other woman were really perfect, she wouldn't be having an affair with a married man. You hear me? She's not perfect, guys. That is an illusion. Plus, let's be honest. If you look close, the fact she too has bills and laundry and wears frumpy clothes at night and has bad breath, she is just hiding it from you for now, right? It is an illusion. Do not fall for it. It is a trap, and the devil loves to paint, oh, the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. It still needs to be mowed. There's no difference. Maybe if you watered your own lawn, it would be green. Oh, did I say that out loud? What? This is what we need to do. Folks, our marriages should be the epitome of what people want to emulate. Not that they're flawless. We screw up. We do silly things all the time. But we see the goal, and we don't even look at the goal anymore. And then when we finally get a glimpse of it, God peels it back, we go, oh, wow. Wow, I want that. What a beautiful, lofty goal to shoot for. Brings you to number three, illusion number three. That which excites you actually deadens you. Oh, boy. That which excites you is really killing you off. Uh, I'm nervous to ask, Pastor. What is it that excites us? Well, your fantasies, of course. That dream world that you have concocted in your mind is so perfect, and and, and it's so exciting. Now, hear me. The biggest part of any illicit relationship takes place right here. This is where it starts, and this is where it festers, between the ears. This is where the devil loves to come and sprinkle his little seeds to let them grow. This is true, especially in the beginning, that flirting stage where it starts to take root before all the sneaking around and all the lies come and all of the meeting up and the playtime happens, all of those things. In this early stage, when your mind starts to think these things are so exciting, it is a tornado going on in your head of endless possibilities. Marriage experts say that all it takes is a suggestive comment from that other person, and your heart rate can literally go up 10 beats per minute. It's so exciting. And men will come and say to their pastor, or ladies, and they'll go to their counselor, and they will say, when they're caught in the middle of this experience, wait for it, but pastor, I've never felt more alive. And the truth is, 
They've never been more dead. That is the truth. Proverbs 21, 16 says it beautifully. It says, the person who strays, the person who strays just from common sense will end up in the company of the dead. You will be dead to the truth about your relationship. The enemy will put these blinders on. You will be dead to the reality of your spiritual condition, dead to the trouble you're making for yourself, dead to the damage you're doing to the next generation, whether it's your kids or your, your loved ones. But here's probably the scariest one of all. We will become deadened to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Man, that is a scary place to be. You want to hear something really creepy? If you get to counsel someone who has strayed and has since repented and has come back to the way of the truth, they will often look back and describe those days as if they're talking about death. They'll say things like, Pastor, I don't get it. I just went brain dead. I, I don't understand. I lost touch with reality. I was so out of it. It was like there was like spiritual scales over my eyes, and I didn't know the damage I was doing. All I knew was I thought I felt alive. It was so exciting, but I was killing people. I didn't even know it. That's why Proverbs warns us over and over, leads us to illusion number four. That which seems to justify your actions actually is what condemns you. Ooh, that's a good one. You need to write that down. What people use to justify, and they're, they're th what is it that justifies your actions? Bogus, lame excuses. The devil will gladly provide you an endless supply of bogus excuses if you want one. I promise. It will be, marriage counselors will tell you this. They cannot believe the times they would sit and listen to men or women come in and justify why their actions are so different than the run-of-the-mill person who's straying or cheating. Oh, that's the, not me. You don't understand. That per, my wife is just not the same person. I married, Pastor. Something's changed. I've tried for years to be a good husband. Pastor, my spouse just doesn't understand me anymore. We just don't seem compatible. And it is shocking, the passion that people will say such ridiculous things, but it's not surprising. You know why? Because people who know they're wrong are typically defensive. And the very first thing they will do is be desperate to try to make things appear different than what they are. Because when you don't have truth on your side, you go for emotion. You, you, ever, you ever discuss with somebody something and you think it's going to be an intellectual conversation and all of a sudden they freak out? It could be on Facebook. And what do they do? They get emotional because they don't have facts. They don't have truth. This is what happens. This is another illusion and the devil is trapping so many good people. I'm justifying my actions. You don't understand. There's this blah, 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 blah. The devil will never stop. You need another excuse? I got one right here. You want to keep going down that path of destruction? Well, I'll supply you with another rationalization because that's what he does. The devil was a liar from the beginning, and we need to have our eyes wide open. All right, this brings us to the last illusion, illusion five. That which seems easy is hard. Huh. Well, that's interesting. What is it that seems easy? Stopping. Quitting knocking it off, calling the whole thing off. A person who is drawn into questionable relationships will tell himself that everything's okay because I can quit anytime I want. Anybody ever heard that with any kind of addiction? It is unbelievable. They tell themselves, if I see that things are getting out of control, I'll just pull the plug and I'll just back away and no one will know. It'll be great. I can have my cake. I can eat. It's going, it's, this is, we are the world. We are the, it's awesome. What's going on? We're not hurting anybody. Mm. Y'all, this goes to pornography too, by the way. Let's call it what it is. It's the new drug. And it is taking absolutely over. And the innocence it is robbing from the next generation is heartbreaking. That which seems easy is actually hard. When lines are crossed... When that forbidden territory is entered, that person suddenly finds that quitting is quite complicated. It is quite difficult. It's like trying to unwrap a fishing line that has gotten caught up in your propeller. It's hopeless. Tr trust me, I am an expert fisherman, okay? I've been twice. Both times I've got my line caught. See what I'm saying? It is so much harder to unwrap these things, to unwrap it once it's wrapped around the axle, Two years ago, on the summer, I started a series called Shark Week, 
And I shared this amazing quote. It's anonymous. I don't know who said it, but this is what it says, and it is so true. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want it to stay, and it'll cost way more than you ever wanted to pay. If we go in with our eyes wide open, if somebody would warn so many people, that's what we're doing today. Here's the antidote. 1 Corinthians 6.18, Paul says it. He says, flee. Four words. Four words. Read it with me. He says, run from sexual sin. Think about this. The most life-destroying sin from all time can be beaten by four simple words. The longest of them has six letters. This is not rocket science. Yet we miss the truth. Maybe if somebody had warned somebody. You see why it's so important today? Now you know these things. If somebody's coming to you and we got people in our families, we got friendships, we go, hey, can I talk to you for a second? It may not be you. You may be able to share godly counsel and say, listen, man, it ends in death. You don't want to go down that road. If you think it's exciting right now, it's not. You haven't even begun to count the cost of what this is going to do to your family. Show of hands, not necessarily your family. Raise your hand if you know the damage that this kind of stuff has caused in somebody else's life. Anybody? Man, that's one out of every two. 50% people know that the damage can come. What a staggering warning. There's a reason why Proverbs talks about this, like a descent into the jaws of death, like a bear trap closing on it. Proverbs 5.5 says, her feet go down to death. Her steps lead down to hell. Proverbs 2, 18 through 20, the house of the immoral woman leads down to death, and her paths are with the dead. None who go to her return. Sounds like a horror movie. Dun, dun, dun. You can check in, but you can never leave, right? This is a le- real live Hotel California happening in Proverbs. None regain the paths of life. What a frightening warning. You think it might be important to God? Because it is an illusion. Now, we got to snap out of this and don't fall for it and help. I want to share with you a story here that I just read that is staggering to me. There's a sweet couple by the name of Sarah and Adam who met online and love blossomed. Sarah had a screen name that was Sweetie. Say it with me. Sweetie. Okay. Adam's screen name was Prince of Joy. Say it with me. Prince of Joy. You have to say it just like I did. Prince of Joy. There you go. Now you've got these two beautiful pictures and you can't wait for love to blossom. They met online because he enters an online chat room from work. She actually works at an internet cafe in a city. They were both married, however, previously and still were to other people. But their marriage, they said, was in trouble. So what began innocently, they started to just share their concerns, their <clears throat> prayer requests. <laughs> Come on, y'all. That's, that's a lot of times, that's a cop-out for gossip, right? Oh, sorry, too real? Okay, I'll, so I'll stick to the story. They shared their concerns with their new found online soulmate. Their soulmate, the pastor, they understood me. And they were so happy, eventually they decided to meet up. But this story didn't have the happy ending they were hoping for. They decided they would show up at a famous shop downtown. And they would each be carrying one red rose. So that when they saw each other across the crowds by the fountains, they would instantly know who their soulmate was. And they could, I don't know, scamper up to them and the hills would be alive with music. And and everything would be perfect. So Sarah says, as she saw across the crowded Avenue, the man arrived. There he was, standing with the rose. And then suddenly it dawned on me something was wrong. And immediately I was shattered. I felt so betrayed because that man was her husband. It turns out, sweetie was already married to Prince of Joy. Sarah and Adam were married to each other and were having an affair with each other. Let that sink in. You don't think the devil is deceptive? Adam would go on to say, I was so happy. I finally found the woman who finally understood me. This shows you it's not always being led astray by your eyes. This was being led astray by his ear. 
Do you catch that? He goes on to say, it turns out I hadn't found anyone new at all. To be honest, I still find it hard to believe that that person, that sweetie who wrote me such wonderful things on the internet is actually the same wicked woman I married who hasn't said a nice word to me for years. Sarah would go on and say, I honestly thought I had found the love of my life. The way this prince of joy spoke to me, the things he wrote, the tenderness in every expression, I saved it because it was something I had never had in my marriage. It was amazing to me. We both seem to be stuck in the same kind of miserable marriage and how right we were. Wait for it. A few months later, they go before the, ju the, the, the judge to file for divorce. Guess what they did? They each accused the other of being unfaithful. Wow. What is going on, y'all? Do you see the importance of protecting and being on guard and being vigilant? Now, nobody wants their relationships to fall apart. Nobody does. Lost people, believers in Christ, nobody does. So why does it happen? How does a once solid relationship like this fall apart? Honestly, I believe most couples are not intending that. I believe the best about them. I believe most couples, I believe it is unintentional. I believe things are sliding slowly and they don't even know it. There's a great song out called A Slow Fade. And that is exactly how it happens. A good relationship almost never deteriorates overnight. I can't tell you how many phone calls I get that say, Pastor, you've got to drop everything and meet with me and my wife. Things have exploded, and we've got, you've, you've got to fix this tonight, and you have 30 minutes to do it. <laughs> you know it didn't take 30 minutes for this to happen. This has been building for years, and I've got to come in and sprinkle some magic pixie dust and poof and put it back together. It was a slow fade. It was, a, it was a, a, a gradual thing where it was diminishing, and there are usually several reasons. So here's what we're going to do. The next time we come together, I'm going to share with you the most common causes of this slow fade and the biblical wisdom to counteract these, okay? If you know somebody who needs this, make sure they are here. You don't want This is going to be the ultimate relationship tune-up. Now, for today, none of this matters if you don't have Christ as the bedrock for your marriage or your relationship. None of this matters if you really only know about God and you've never met him. None of this, may, if your relationships aren't built on Christ, I would love to introduce you to him today because that's where the foundation starts, okay? Pray with me right now. Let's bow together. God, I thank you that you didn't leave us off to wander on our own in darkness, to stumble around in our sin, but you provided a way. And Lord, while we are not perfect, I thank you that you have showed us what the model is. Forgive us, Lord, for trying to change it or alter it or redefine it or take a vote to decide what your word is going to say. Lord, forgive us. God, I pray that you would help us to come to you. And Lord, for that person that may just know about you, I pray that right now in the quiet and the seriousness of this moment, that they would surrender to you, that they would ask you to come invade their life. Lord, forgive us for our sins. We repent. We walk 180 degrees in the opposite direction, and we acknowledge you as the God you are. And we invite you to take up residence. Holy Spirit, seal our hearts for the day of redemption. Become our Lord, our Savior, our sustainer. From this day forward, Lord, we want to make you the one who sits on the throne of our heart. I thank you that your word says any who claim your name will be saved. Lord, we do that. We acknowledge you as Savior and Creator, Redeemer and Lord, and we give you full rights to every room in our life. And we do this in Jesus' powerful name. Now, this morning, we've talked about a lot of stuff, and there's been a lot of good information, a lot of wisdom. Maybe you got somebody laid on your heart that you want to come and pray for. Feel free to do that. No one will bother you. If you want to come and kneel for a minute, go for it. Maybe you want to pray with me or somebody. I'll stick around after church, or you can come pray right during this song. This is what we do. In a minute, we stand, we sing one last song of worship. You can stay where you are. You can come kneel. You can grab somebody to go pray with you. You can pray with me. Just be obedient. Whatever God has laid on your heart, that's all you have to do. This is your time of commitment, okay? Let's stand together. The words will be on the screen. This is your time. Just be obedient to him. We sing glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God.